welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is David with Heart for Iran. I'm the development manager, and I'm really just excited to have this webinar today. So much is happening in our world today with the COVID-19 situation, and uh, just really thankful to have our panelists here and have our team. Uh, we've been at Heart for Iran doing a lot of activities around um, the COVID-19 virus and outbreak and what's happening in Iran. And this purpose of this webinar is just to share with you uh, what we're doing and what's happening and give you guys an opportunity uh, to answer questions. Before we get started though, I just wanna acknowledge that I know a lot of you are probably going through a lot in your own home, in your own town. Uh, this is a worldwide situation and so we don't wanna minimize that at all. Uh, we understand that this is affecting your neighborhood as well. Uh, and we're praying for you and we're here for you as well. If you have any questions or comments, we wanna pray for you in your situation uh, today. But for now, we wanna focus on Iran and uh, give, it, give our panelists a chance to share. So right now, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Mike, who is the president of Heart for Iran, who's gonna be here with us. Uh, we also have Sasan, who's the head of the Mohabat TV uh, virtual church activities. And we have Nazanin, who is the head of Mohabat TV Program Response uh, Center. So we're gonna get a variety of perspectives. We're gonna have a good time today. And we're excited that you're here joining with us right now. So before we get started, uh, let me start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day and we thank you for this chance to be together. God, we wanna lift up for you uh, the people in Iran we wanna lift up for you uh, what's happening in the situation with COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And Lord, we just ask you to bless uh, everyone that's involved. Lord, we ask for your help in this situation or that you would bring relief to the people of Re Iran and especially those in the underground house church movement that are suffering right now. So Lord, we just take this time to lift you up and put you at the center of this uh, webinar and we just wanna pray for all of the people that are joining us. And we ask you to bless their individual homes, their cities, and the situation that they're going through. Uh, in your name, Jesus, amen. All right, well, first off, we just uh, wanna talk a little bit about the format for the webinar. We've got our panelists here that I just introduced. Each one of them has a different perspective on what's happening inside of Iran. And so we want to jump right to them and give them an opportunity to share. Then we're going to have a time to take questions from you. So as a webinar participant, we would love for you to jump in and ask in the Q&A section, put your questions there, and we will definitely get to those at the end. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get started with Mike. Mike is a former Muslim, born Muslim in Iran. He's now the president of Heart for Iran, super excited to introduce him to you and have him share. And uh, Mike, we just wanna talk about who is Heart for Iran and how is Heart for Iran playing a role in this coronavirus right now? Thank you. Uh, well, it's good to be here. Heart for Iran is a non-political Christian organization um, and our organization is in partnership with over 100 ministries. And our goal is to be able to uh, give a voice to the Christian uh, uh, movement inside the country of Iran. And uh, we are realizing that these days, the number of Muslim uh, background believers, individuals have, who have they're, they're born into Islam in Iran and have become Christians is on the rise. And these are the cross section of people in Iran that usually have no voice, they're highly persecuted uh, and their rights is usually violated. We're talking about human rights and, and religious freedom rights. We try to be a voice. We just try to be a voice of encouragement. We love and, and respect all the people of Iran from all different backgrounds and, and and religions, our goal is basically to bring the gospel of Iran. And we are very intentional in, in, in being vocal and, and bringing awareness to God's amazing work in Iran, among the Iranian people, among the Persians uh, in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, there are roughly about 120 million Farsi speakers in those three countries in, in that region. So we try to uh, be a voice for them and uh, also try to encourage them. Fantastic, thanks Mike. What specifically is Heart for Iran doing right now to help those that are impacted in Iran by the coronavirus? Uh, Heart for Iran has a 24 seven satellite TV into Iran called Mohabat TV. We've been uh, airing broadcasting into Iran since 2006. 
And we also have been involved in social media through the uh, family of partners that we have. Uh, we are able to send Bibles into Iran to people who are asking for Bibles and uh, help them bring uh, the gospel to them and help them launch uh, house churches. As you and I know, in Iran, house churches are not legal. They're all underground. Uh, so the, the, the movement is very much alive. And uh, we have been, so therefore we receive a lot of contacts, phone calls, chats, emails from inside Iran, roughly about six to 800 uh, contacts per day from inside Iran. And uh, uh, recently we're realizing a lot of people that are dealing with coronavirus reaching out to us, asking us questions. It appears that much like the rest of the world, Iran is dealing with a huge dilemma, huge challenge. They are saying that uh, right now Iran is the epicenter of coronavirus uh, in, the country, uh, in, in the entire Middle East. Um, uh, it was only a few hours ago that Iranian authorities released the number of 32,000 Iranians being infected. Um, um, most countries and experts believe that the numbers are much, much higher uh, than we thought. Uh, just like in America, just like in Europe, everywhere else. Um, so uh, we are trying to bring the message of hope. We're trying to tell them that there's light in uncertainty and there's faith in volatility. So Mike, some of the people that are watching this webinar, they might not know that much about Mohaba TV yet or Harfur Iran. So when you say you're on satellite TV, how many people uh, do you guys estimate are watching you on satellite TV and how big is this movement in Iran of Christians? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, David, I gotta tell you that we don't have all the exact accurate numbers. Everything that I would say is an estimate. We know that in Iran, for example, there are about 80 million uh, people that live there and their, their numbers anywhere from 60 to 70% of the population has access to satellite TV. Of those people, the cross section that have access to satellite TV, we did an independent survey and the survey, survey released that uh, told us that roughly about uh, 16 to 17 million Iranians have responded to one or more of our programs within a year period. That's roughly about 20% of the cross section that have access uh, to satellite TV. And that does not include our online efforts and our virtual church efforts that are going into Iran live every week. That's fantastic news. So it, some of the missions articles show that Iran is one of the fastest growing uh, churches in the world. We want to comment on that? Uh, yes, World Mission announced, uh, uh, for those friends who have joined us that may not know, what God is doing in Iran. You may, you may think that Iran is this backwards country where uh, you know, uh, it's God forsaken, it, it's hopeless. But I gotta tell you, if you, got, if you put on God's uh, um, glasses on, you realize that he's very much alive. Jesus is building his church. The spirit of God is moving. Uh, the church is, is very strong in Iran. It's extremely encouraging and I want you to be encouraged. During this time of darkness with coronavirus, the church in Iran for the past at least five to, uh, to, to six years has been extremely active, growing and thriving and multiplying. Uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, uh, the, the news that is coming from inside Iran is very encouraging and, and very positive. And uh, we're just excited to share with you some of the stories later on today of people who have called us, to, who are sharing with us. We are going to hear from uh, Dr. Sosan Tavassoli, who's with us about uh, what, what exactly is happening now with the coronavirus in Iran. And then uh, also from uh, uh, Nazanin, uh, about actual in individuals who have contacted us from Iran, telling us stories about hope, uh, struggle uh, with coronavirus as believers, and how underground church is struggling with, just like everybody else in Iran. Amen. Well, this is very encouraging, Mike, and we want to definitely come back to you on some of this. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, to everyone that's participating in the webinar, if you want to post a question under the Q&A button, um, or if you're putting your questions on Facebook Live, uh, we have an admin there that's going to push those questions over to us. So please, if you have questions for Mike, go ahead and send those when you have a chance. Right now, we want to go ahead and shift to Pastor Sasan. Uh, Sasan, uh, you and I have been working together for a while. Mike, you and I have been working together for a while as well. Uh, we've all been working in this region of Iran, Nazanin as well. And we're all happy that you're here, Sasan. Uh, you are the pastor of the Mohabat TV virtual church initiatives. And so we're excited to have you here and want to hear uh, specifically from you. Do you see this coronavirus situation in Iran as an opportunity for the church? And how do you reflect on that? 
First of all, thank you, Chris, for the great question. And I also want to give my greetings to uh, folks who are watching us. As Mike was just telling us, Jesus has been at work in Iran. Uh, I tell the church in America that Jesus has been running around loose in the Iranian world for the past couple of decades. Uh, we celebrate the fact that more Iranian Muslims have come to Christ in the last few years than the last 1400 years combined. I just saw somebody posted a note that Jesus promised that he will build his church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus has been fulfilling that promise in the Iranian world before our very eyes, in our time, in our generation. So this is an exciting time of growth of the gospel. It's also a time of great persecution. Uh, our church buildings have been shut down. The government is in the process of confiscating those properties. So for the past couple of decades, many Christians are gathering in secret house church gatherings. So I'll, I'll come back to that later on. But coming now to the current crisis of the virus, this also, despite the challenges that obviously provides for the whole world, including Iran, with its inadequate health system and the epicenter of, of the virus in the Middle East, this provides a unique opportunity for the gospel as well, this crisis. What, why, what do I mean by that? The Iranian people have been in a process of being disillusioned with Islam, the official religion of the country, with the broken promises of the Iranian revolution. And in the process of that, that disillusionment, many people have been in a spiritual journey searching for answers. The coronavirus added to that disillusionment. How so? Because the coronavirus came to Iran through, uh, it, is, it, is, it is believed by even the Iranian authorities, that the virus spread in Iran through Chinese Shiite seminary students uh, in the city of Qom. Now, Qom is one of the most sacred, holy sites in Shiite Islam. It's like the Vatican of Shiite Islam in Iran. Tens of thousands of Muslim theological students study in Qom. Shrines, sacred shrines exist in Qom, and the virus started in that city. The virus was associated, the spread of the virus, with pilgrims visiting Islamic shrines. These are shrines that are supposed to have the power of healing and blessing. These shrines have become the centers of spreading the virus. And people from the city of Qom have been traveling. These are the New Year periods in Iran. People are on vacations. Uh, many Iranians are not heeding the call to stay at home. And so many people from Qom are traveling around the country and are spreading this virus. So the virus came into the country through religious Shiite students. The virus spread in the country from religious Shiite holy sites. And the virus is you know, expanding in the country by people traveling out of these centers. So once wow. again, people are saying, these religious sites that are supposed to be sites for blessing and healing have become a site for spreading disease. And the Iranian regime has been covering up. A lot of people believe that the statistics in Iran, although they are still quite high, they are not even, maybe they are a fraction of what is going on in Iran in terms of the rates of infection and the number of people dying and the government's inadequate response to the virus, both financially, uh, medically, uh, all of these have once again brought up new questions for Iranian Muslims, questioning the truthfulness of Islam, questioning the adequacy of the, the revolutionary you know, government and revolutionary system of running the, the country. And so this disillusionment, I believe, uh, is once again providing an opportunity for us to talk about Jesus, to talk about the true shepherd, the true healer. And, uh, and so I believe that we need to uh, deal with the challenges of, of the virus in, in all kinds of practical ways, but offer true hope and true answers uh, by presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Sasan, the, the fact that it's coming from these religious sites and this is what people are seeing, uh, what does that do to the mentality of the people who have been under this uh, religious regime for more than 30 years? Um, what, what is that doing to their mindset and, and how is this really impacting the very structures uh, that the government is founded on and that the people are relying on? Yeah, so yeah I, I really believe it has shaken. I mean, many people have given up faith in God in Iran or faith in Islam. 
uh, that's already true. We have a huge wave of young people, especially, that have become very secular in their outlook, very agnostic, are searching for answers. But those who are still committed uh, to the traditional religious beliefs and convictions, I believe this has shaken many of them to their very core. And now this has happened, you know, for our Western audience, I want to highlight things like this have happened in the history of the Western world too. Uh, a little history lesson that might be appropriate, in my opinion. Uh, the earthquake that destroyed the city of Lisbon in Portugal in 1755, it really shook up people about the goodness of God. How can a good God allow such death and destruction, especially if it happened on a Sunday as Christians were in churches and Lisbon was destroyed. And so in, this, this is the period of the Enlightenment. And people began to question God, the goodness of God, the wisdom of God. So the Western world has gone through crisis like this, spiritual crisis. I believe this is equivalent to that kind of a crisis for our people in Iran, shaking up uh, the very foundations of belief in Shiite Islam, in the, in the efficacy of the Shiite saints, the efficacy of Shiite shrines, as being centers of healing and blessing. And especially, there are so many reports, this is another point, of Muslim clerics dealing in superstitious ways with this disease. You know, Muslims, Muslim fanatics wanting to visit these shrines, kissing, the, kissing these objects, spreading this disease, not heeding you know, medical advice and medical instructions. So it's, it's associating Iranian Islam and the leadership of the Iranian regime with superstition, with being not uh, caring enough for people, with not you know, providing care for in a security for the population. So it's, it's increasing the disillusionment uh, with, the, with the religious establishment. This is really my belief that this will change the, land, the religious landscape of Iran in fundamental ways in the coming years. So this, this crisis is just one more thing that's really crumbling the foundations uh, that people have relied on inside of Iran, and yes. that's creating an opportunity. Yes, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to get into a very you know, political analysis, but a few months ago, the Iranian regime killed many Iranians out on the streets around the country because they were protesting the significant rise in gas prices, tripling gas prices overnight. So people were already um, had become quite angry with the Iranian government, and then the shooting of the airline uh, a, 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 few, uh, a few months ago, that also created more anger towards the Iranian regime. Now the Iranian response to the virus and, taking, and not taking responsibility for the welfare of the people, uh, these are just adding to the, to the struggle of the Iranian people, the tension uh, and the attitude they have towards the regime. And then again, in the coming months, we are gonna hear more about the financial bankruptcy of the, of the Iranian government. And the fact that even when Western agencies wanted to help the Iranians to deal with the virus, for example, a group of doctors without borders went to Iran from France, but Iranian authorities refused, uh, refused their permission to allow them to help the Iranian people. So the Iranian regime constantly says, no, we don't need any help. The people are hurting. The government is not really responsible. So this is adding to the frustration and disillusionment, both religiously and politically. Wow, Mike, I want to jump back to you real quick. Uh, Sasan is, you know, talking about this. Do you agree this is maybe the reason that there's been so much movement of Christianity, Christianity and Christianity has been growing so fast is that these underpinnings uh, are really just getting questioned? Absolutely. People in Iran are not happy. They're not happy. And now, I mean, we, we just talked to one of our um, contacts in the underground church in Iran, and uh, they're saying that they're facing challenges and they're dying. Let me, let me, sh let me read for you what uh, is the real tangible uh, sense of Iranian Christians, and Iranians all general in Iran are dealing. We asked one of the, uh, one of the uh, contacts in a house church in Iran, we said, um, how are the Christians in Iran doing during coronavirus crisis, and what are they, the challenges they're facing? I'm reading you the answer that they sent us. This is directly from inside Iran. They said, we face challenges for all aspects of our lives. Now, as the coronavirus is hitting us really hard, especially more so economically, so that verifies exactly what Sosan is saying. They said, many of us are out of jobs. Many of us are trying to make ends meet. 
uh, as the country has basically been shut down for a month. They also, uh, we also want to go out and serve people that are affected by the virus, but have very, very limited resources. So pray that God would give us creative ways to serve the people affected. You're dealing with a country that is going through crisis. It's gone through a major socio-political crisis for years, but now it's going through a health crisis. So you compound all of that and you say, well, everyone's going through that challenge. Now the Christian uh, uh, minority in Iran is, is uh, trying to get out of their, their shell, they're, they're hiding and they're saying, we want to give back to the society. It doesn't matter if it's a Muslim, if it doesn't matter if it's the person and the family that just persecuted me, what can I do to to shine God's love to these people. And my friends, that is exactly what we're hearing from Iran, the underground church members right now. Yes, there are some churches that are still going forward, but a vast majority are getting out of the uh, underground church. They're going among the public, passing out hand sanitizers, praying with people, telling people about Jesus. We're getting phone calls about people asking for Bibles, more so now during coronavirus, which is very interesting, meaning that uh, there's an organic, um, uh, uprising of Iranian underground force given out, just giving back uh, to the society that is hating them, that is persecuting them. That is Jesus at work. Isn't that amazing? I get goosebumps yeah. when I hear Jesus just being, uh, just shining uh, through his people, uh, these converts in Iran. Amen. Amen. Well, Sasan, thank you so much. Mike, thank you. I want to jump to Nazanin real quick. We're getting a lot of questions on Facebook and also in the thread. And I want to make sure we have enough time for those. But Nazanin, you are the head of Mohabbat TV program response, which means you're talking to callers every single day and people that send emails, people that call. You guys have a call center 24 hours a day that's uh, receiving response from Iran. What are people saying inside of Iran right now during this crisis? And what are you hearing uh, from the viewers of Mohabbat TV? Well, uh, at our call center, we are really busy uh, answering and praying for people at this desperate time. You know, we are on Telegram, on WhatsApp, calls. Uh, they're coming and asking for prayer. Their mom is sick with corona, their relative, their neighbor is sick. And we, at, uh, we try to give them hope. Uh, we try to encourage them tell them to trust the Lord. They're really desperate because when they are sick, then they have no way to go. Um, the hospitals are full. They do not take new patients. There is no medicine. So it's all uh, home remedies or it's us. It's God. They turn to God. They turn to prayer. They shout out, uh, God, where are you? So it's a great time, uh, yet it's sad, it's sober, but it's a great opportunity where we can pray with the people. And in fact, uh, just this week, I got a call from a father who, uh, whose child, 10-year-old son, uh, was sick with corona, very high fever, took him to the hospital, and uh, they took him in and hours later they told them to leave mom and dad left and they wouldn't go home they kept saying we they actually literally beat him up to go home they said you cannot stay at the hospital um so for two days he was wondering what to do so he came home he called us and uh he said I've tried everything. Uh, please pray to Jesus. He was a Muslim. So he says, um, pray to Jesus, my last hope. Jesus can heal my son. And at least we can have a news where he is, how he's doing. Then not letting us go to the hospital, not letting us see him. So we prayed and um, his wife called just the next morning because it was late night, he called us about two, three their morning. So um, the early morning, his wife called from the hospital that they let me see my son, he's doing better, but we cannot bring him home. So he was happy and he gave his heart to Jesus. So we, de we see these stories a lot. So Nazanin, and we you're see. Seeing... 
Yeah, I'm sorry. So Nazanin, yeah. you're, you agree with Sassan that this is an opportunity for the church. Muslims are actually calling you at this time, looking for some hope, uh, looking for opportunities to hear your prayers. Yes, absolutely. And David, let me tell you, since families are together, um, the whole family comes to Christ, you know, wow. before maybe one individual would call and we would pray for them and one person would give their heart to the Lord. But now families are coming to Christ. They're all gathered together. They watch Mahabad. They dialogue with each other. They call us, ask questions, ask prayer. And, you know, we've seen a lot get healed from Corona. We've heard, you know, that they prayed for their mom, their sister, you know, they get healed, praise the Lord. And family, we, I just had a call, uh, a family with, uh, the mom called, she was sick, but she didn't have Corona. She was sick, she got healed, and um, uh, her whole family of five of them, uh, the husband and three children, they all gave their heart to Jesus, and the neighbor came, and they gave their heart to Jesus. And, you know, it's uh, Noru's time, so uh, they go visit each other. They shouldn't, but they visit each other's home, wishing happy Noru's. And that's a great opportunity where families and neighbors and relatives together, they come to Christ. It's such a joy, you know, in the midst of all this bad news, we hear good news of the gospel. Can I also add a little something here, um, David? Uh, you're asking a very, very good question. The, the whole concept of ministry, um, what I think what we need to do is just love people. Uh, just just exude grace and love of God and, and, and his son, Jesus, to everybody. And, and I think that's the most powerful thing. Um, when you are asking, uh, again, another question that I asked people in Iran, I said, um, tell us, uh, what are you hungry for? They said, well, let us tell you that our government hasn't done anything except suggesting self-quarantine. Um, but uh, it was, you know, they're saying that some people are, are going to shrines and still want to go to shrines to see God's face. You know what? The best way to define ministry right now for us is to just love everyone. Just tell everybody that we love you and just be a shoulder for them. And I think that's the most powerful thing that we learned from ministry in Iran. Um, um, I'm sure you're going to be asking Sassan the question about virtual church. What, but why do you think a lot of people are not coming online because they want to talk and pray with somebody? Not because they just want to change religion, simply because they're realizing that there's something different with the message of grace, hope, love and acceptance and i think that's contagious and that's powerful and that's really the core of our message amen so i just want to jump back to uh, what nazanin was saying we haven't spoke about the fact that this is the no ruse uh, season happening in iran and, and people are wanting to get out on the streets but because of the coronavirus people are stuck in their homes sometime even though some people are still going out on the streets and then the idea that you know we have a satellite tv channel that people can watch when they are stuck in their homes and then they can also make a phone call uh, to you while they're stuck in their homes they can email and then uh, as mike alluded pastor sasan you have a digital presence a virtual church uh, how do you see that sasan uh, impacting and what's the timeliness of this virtual church during this kind of a season yeah i mean <laughs> To me, um, maybe many of our Western um, Christian brothers and sisters are experiencing virtual church for the first time. They are sitting in their homes and in front of their computers as they participate in their congregational worship time on Sundays. That's now become a reality for many people around the world. This has been a reality for many years now uh, because many Iranian believers are just isolated families in their homes with no access to a church, no access to a home group of Christian believers, sometimes no access to even a Bible. Their faith is just them and their TV set, them and their programs on their computer. So Mohabbat TV has launched a virtual church. We've been doing this for, we've, we've had classes, virtual classes before, and now it's a virtual church. We have our worship leader from London, 
a worship team in Turkey. I am from the US. We have different pastors from Europe and UK. It's a global platform where we come online uh, every Thursday, 9 p.m. Tehran's time, and we have a church service. We receive prayer requests. We pray for people. We answer questions. We have fellowship. And the, the main message that we are trying to communicate is the message of hope. Uh, Sometimes Jesus heals, sometimes he doesn't. But Jesus is the sovereign Lord. He's conquered death. Uh, we are safe in his arms. The past couple of weeks, I have preached on passages from the book of Revelation. Uh, we looked at Revelation chapter 1, the image of the glorified Christ, how we have a Savior who's conquered death, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It's, it's, it's unshakable. And empires rise and empires fall, but Jesus and his kingdom uh, are eternal and we can count our, our lives on his promises. Uh, this past Thursday, we looked at a passage uh, from Revelation 2, Jesus' message to the church of Smyrna, that Jesus is in control of our lives. Jesus is in control of history. Nothing is surprising Jesus and the time of testing is a limited time, but God is working out his purposes for our lives, for our church, for our nation. So the message of hope, the message that, yes, we Christians also suffer like non-Christians. Uh, the sickness doesn't you know, leave us alone, but in the midst of it, we have hope. We can rejoice and have faith in the sovereign king our savior who's conquered death, conquered the grave, uh, emphasizing how our faith uh, is perfectly in line with, with uh, accepting medical guidelines and, and being cautious and using wisdom uh, to keep ourselves safe, how our faith and in the history of the church, how the church has reached out in times of plagues, in times of death and fear, the church has reached out with love and confidence. And uh, I've done programs about one of the one of the uh, in the social media world uh some comments from martin luther and how he approached the plague that uh, uh was spreading in germany in the in the 1520s uh and the wisdom that luther brought to that context that we can have faith in god and we can be wise uh, in how we go about our daily activities and keep away from, uh, from sickness and, and disease and plagues. So Christianity offers a lot of wisdom, uh, not hocus pocus superstition like many Muslim clerics are offering, uh, but true wisdom and yet faith and confidence and hope. And that's the unique message of the gospel that we wow. are offering through our social media, satellite TVs and platforms, virtual church community. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sasan, and thank you for being there with these guys during this tough time. Uh, I want to go back to Nazanin and, and also just ask again, you know, as Sasan's talking about this message of hope and people are in isolation and people maybe are suffering loneliness, um, how important is it to have a, a call center where they can reach out to you and, and what are they saying and what are they asking in the, in the midst of this? Well, as I was saying, um, people are looking for hope. There is nowhere to go. The hospitals are full. There is no medicine. So their hope is Jesus. And we are so happy. We are here 24 hours. We are here uh, seven days a week and on all uh, platforms, social media, uh, calls, emails, we are available to give them encouragement and to give them um, hope, to give them the good news in the midst of all these bad news. And uh, we are so happy for the virtual church. That's a great opportunity because, because of the current quarantine, uh, we do not have live shows on the channel, but the virtual church is helping us to connect with people and just give them the good news. It's such a, Great opportunity, great time. Amen. Yeah, man. Well, that's this is fantastic, Mike. I see that there's a lot of questions, and we've already been answering some of those. I want to go ahead and jump into those questions, but do you want to talk about this isolation and loneliness real quick, and what you're seeing uh, as a leader of this ministry? Yes, yes. Uh, so we try not to be managers. Uh, time of crisis, um, how to lead through a crisis requires leaders, uh, not managers. 
uh, and because leaders have to be innovative, they need to listen to the Holy Spirit and they need to be able to walk where God wants them to walk. And that's not always the easy thing. That is why we feel that um, um, in a ministry like Hearts for Iran, it's not one individual who's a leader, it's, it's a team leadership. It's really God at the helm. And uh, that's what we've been trying to model through our organization by working with so many ministry partners. Some of you are watching this program right now. Thank you for your support, for your partnership. Um, and uh, so uh, at the time right now, the people are in isolation. We are in isolation. Our, our entire ministry, much like the rest of the ministries and businesses in, in America, uh, we all have to work from home. Um, we need to pray for grace. We need to pray for providence. Uh, somebody just asked, uh, how can we pray? Um, first and foremost, we want to ask you to please pray for Iran, and not just for Iran uh, and Iranian community, but also the global community that's dealing with coronavirus. Now in Iran, people are uniquely turning to a message of hope. Uh, and that, that, is, that makes it very unique because what makes Iran a good prime place for ministry and I give it back is through this crisis, people are seeking the love of their creator and we're there to tell them that Jesus loves them. So that's what makes Man. Iran unique for us. Uh, but through this isolation for us, pray that people in Iran would, uh, would uh, find hope uh, in, in the person of Christ like we have. Uh, life, uh, uh, also find grace and be able to forgive. There's a lot of finger pointing among all of us uh, uh, for different reasons. Uh, God wants us to forgive and walk in grace. Uh, God wants us to be healed. Um, so do pray for people of Iran. Do pray for us as well because now with coronavirus and isolation everywhere, our hands are tied. Thankfully, we could still send the signals into Iran. Thankfully, as Nazan said, the number of co contacts to us are higher. Therefore, you realize that the gospel is right now in more demand in Iran. We see that, my friends. So if one thing you could take away today with you is uh, God is working in Iran, and during coronavirus, there's more demand for knowing God's hope through Jesus. Uh, so do pray for us also to be able to have the, the means uh, people are asking for more Bibles. I mean, just somebody asked me uh, on, the, on the question. They said, how can we help? How can we support? Well, I say, pray. But also, uh, there are more people asking for Bibles now. So uh, help us out. Each Bible costs roughly about $7 to, to send one Bible to Iran. And uh, go to our website, www.heartforiran.com. Uh, over there, you'll see information. You could stand up and help us out because $7 for, let's say, us in, in the West, is not really uh, that life-threatening, but that could bring hope uh, to, to, to a family in Iran, to a community in Iran, uh, that, that they're feeling they're being perished. So um, Man, isolation yeah. may be something that is induced upon all of us by the world, but hope, grace, love, and just possibilities in Christ are endless. Amen. Very good. So I want to go ahead and jump to some of those questions. A uh, couple of questions have to deal with persecution um, we mentioned that, you know, Iran is one of the fastest growing churches uh, in the world, uh, even though there's an Islamic government. We mentioned satellite TV. Uh, there's a lot of questions that have to do with that. Uh, is the government trying to stop us through satellite TV or our digital platforms? Um, are people being persecuted or suffering as a result of becoming Christian? Let's just answer that really quickly because there's a multiple questions there. Uh, having to do with the government's play on just Christianity in general. So which uh, one of you guys want to speak to that? Let me, let me jump in. Uh, yeah, we need to uh, let our audience know that um, the situation with the church in Iran has been going on for a number of years now, where Christians have been persecuted very heavily. Uh, we've had a number of Christian leaders that have been martyred over the years. Uh, thousands of Christians, especially uh, Christian leaders, people who are active in sharing their faith, have been in prison, have been jailed. So this has been going on for a few decades. It's nothing new. In the latest episodes, in the latest chapter of this series of persecution and crackdown, we are hearing that uh, some Christians are being released from prisons because of this virus, but many Christians are still being kept in prison and are not, are not, being, are not released. So there is a particular danger that believers are facing because of this virus crisis and they are unjustly uh, in prison. Uh, in terms of satellite, uh, satellite ministry, satellite dishes are illegal in Iran. We have to emphasize that. 
that Ir the Iranian regime says you are not allowed to have satellite TV and satellite dishes. And yet, the Iranian regime estimates that 60% of Iranians have satellite TV. And as far as the eyes can see, there are satellite dishes on rooftops. Now, most Americans don't understand. How can it be illegal and yet in plain view in public? Welcome to the paradoxical nature of Iranian society and Iranian government. So satellite dishes are illegal. Every now and then, the police force go into a neighborhood, knock down the dishes, find the people that have them, and then people buy new dishes and install them. So that's the cat and mouse game that the people have been playing with the, with the government for a number of decades. But it's because of this dynamic that many people can have satellite TV in their homes. And people, even from rural areas, this is not just upper class people in the cities, people of all socioeconomic levels of Iranian society have satellite TV, have access to satellite TV. Now, some you know, all Christian websites are blocked. Uh, many, you know, many social media platforms are blocked, and yet people bypass, people know how to bypass those, uh, those blocks and access social media platforms. So that's the dynamic in terms of there is no official freedom for the, for the spreading of the message of the gospel. Churches have been closed. Bible society has been shut down. Uh, handing out Bibles can get you landed in prison. Gathering together in a house church group is illegal. Satellite dishes are illegal. Christian websites are blocked. That's the reality of what the Iran, what, how the Iranian regime is trying to fight the spread of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And yet, over all these strategies, Jesus is victorious. Jesus is, uh, you know, as I said, leading a spiritual revolution, transforming hearts and minds and lives and families and neighborhoods. And that's the beauty of the gospel, that through, uh, even in the midst of the suffering, even in the midst of the brokenness and persecution, Jesus is alive. Jesus okay. is sitting on his throne. Jesus is fulfilling his promise that he's building his church. And we can be witnesses and we can be co-laborers uh, in this kingdom, in this kingdom dream that's unfolding in the Iranian, among the Iranian people. Nazanin, I want to get back to you. Have people that you talk to on a daily basis, have they been arrested? Have you ministered to people that are being persecuted for watching this? What are they saying? What have you heard of, you know, with your years of doing this ministry, the reality of this government persecution on the, on the viewers and on the believers? Um, well, David, if they are being arrested, we wouldn't know because they wouldn't call us back because of fear. But we are aware of threats. A lot of them get... You know, as soon as they disconnect their phone call with us, they get a call from the government saying that you have called a Christian channel or an outside source, you're in danger, next time we'll, you know, arrest you. So there's a lot of threats and they actually, some, some have said that they've come to my house, you know, and uh, they've threatened me to take my belongings, my house, my kids. Uh, so there is a lot of threat. That's why the fear is there and people are afraid to call. Um, oh, but, right uh, okay. yes, um, we, we, we know, we know that uh, uh, many have been arrested, but still, you know, once you trust the Lord, once Jesus is your King, uh, you know, that hope is there, that courage is there, that boldness is there. Praise God. He protects. Amen. Mike, what do you, make some comments on the uh, nature of this persecution. And then also, let's change the topic into what people sure. can do. Sure. If I, if I may, there are some really good questions that have come in that I, would, I think it's worth addressing yeah. the next uh, 10 minutes that we have. Uh, may I, do I have your permission, David, to read a couple of these questions and try to answer them? Absolutely. Yeah, we can jump to those. Great. Uh, the, a question came uh, uh, that says, uh, can you speak of your confidence that financial support and even Bibles are not getting intercepted by the opposition to the gospel? Uh, first thing first, uh, you cannot send financial support to Iran. There, there are all fact, uh, sanctions and government regulations uh, that money cannot go in, in Iran. And we are in compliance 
to the to the law to the domestic law uh, federal law in America and also international law. Uh, that's extremely important for us to obey the law. So uh, we do not send financial support. We do try to send through again not us but through our, our ministry partners Bibles into the country of Iran, and those are very tricky. Um, uh, yes, uh, they're, they're not easily uh, brought into the country. They're creative ways, but they are getting inside the country. And, uh, and I wanted to share with you that that is a wonderful uh, thing that is happening. Another uh, person asked the question, how can us in America have an impact? Well, uh, in, in our neighborhood, I wanted to share with you that uh, Heart for Iran Ministries has put together a, 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 a one-day symposium for churches in America uh, on how to reach the Muslim next door. Um, the most important thing is understanding the worldviews. Once you understand the culture and the worldview of your Muslim neighbor in your community, you'll be able to create a uh, connection and a bridge. Please contact us, email us at info at heartforiran.com. We'll send you our resources at no cost. We'll even come to your church and conduct half an hour or half a day or full day seminar for you guys. Another question that came in, David, I wanted to just real fast. It says, how does a Christian display fearless a fearlessness in the face of persecution. Um, that goes to the theology of persecution. We don't have an answer for that from our human nature, but I've got to tell you that when Holy Spirit comes, people get convicted. I'm sure Pastor Sosan could spend hours talking about that. He actually does talk about that on Mahabad TV. Go visit our archives, and he has done series of that. Uh, the other question is, what sort of a practical help Iranian Christians can offer in this crisis? Number one is pray. Please do pray. Number two is, as I shared with you, the, the demand for Bibles are high. We're trying to send Bibles into the country of Iran. There are other ways for you guys to help. Somebody ask the question of how can we financially support Heart for Iran? Well, what if you support Heart for Iran, we then in turn support the ministry partners that are doing a lot of work. Uh, we don't make money off of any of these things, guys. Uh, our goal is to be able to bring the gospel to the people of Iran, and we do that. We do our best work through the champions of our partnership, which are our partners. So, uh, if you want to find out ways to give, go visit heartforiran.com. Uh, that's H uh, E uh, A R T number four, iran.com. Uh, on the donate part, you could go ahead and join us. Uh, our goal is not here to uh, come here and ask for money. Our goal is to inform you guys. But if God puts that in your heart, then God's work will go forward. Uh, and there are more questions over here. They say, how different ministries can create a coalition for the time of crisis? Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do, my friend. A heart for Iran was created to, to bring people that, are, that have a heart and a passion to see the great commission accomplished in Iran to come together. We try to be very open um, and generous with our resources. We provide free airtime on our satellite channel to all the Iranian ministries. And uh, we raise money and we pay for that. Uh, so um, we, that's what we're trying to do. We would love to connect with you or your ministries. Uh, contact us again. We would love to be in touch with you. Uh, David, back to you. All right, very good. You, co you cover quite a few of the questions right there. Uh, one of the things we did want to talk about is I see that our admin create put the link there, raisedonors.com forward slash heart for Iran forward slash crisis. Uh, they put that in the thread if, you, if everyone can see that. Basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Heart for Iran has created a fund at this time to help support um, those people inside of Iran in the way that we can support them. You touched on that a little bit, but you wanna give us a couple of specific ways this money's gonna be used uh, to encourage and help support this underground movement inside of Iran. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the things that is happening is we're seeing a lot of Iranians uh, that are listening to our program make a decision and give their heart to Christ. So that, that's what we see, we call salvation, somebody who gives their heart to Christ. So um, what uh, we are doing, and one of the things that, one of the major platforms that Pastor Sosan is leading and our sister Nazanin is also helping uh, maintain that uh, is, is our virtual church. This is designed to bring the isolated believers that, in, that are in Iran that are afraid. There's no place for a fellowship. Um, you bring them together. It really, you may have a theological challenge with the word uh, virtual church. So think of it as an online fellowship. Uh, but in reality, anytime that one or two people are there in the name of Jesus, that's the church right there. So we, we are loosely calling it the virtual church. That is one of the number one platforms right now that is really, really working. As the churches in America are all going online, we went online last October. 
And that first time, roughly about a thousand people joined us and one person from Afghanistan gave his heart to, to Christ named Ali. So right now, uh, some of the support that may come in would go towards ministering to Iranians using virtual platforms that are available, YouTube, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, Facebook Live, a whole bunch of different venues that are available. So yes, we are hustling, we are moving forward to bring the gospel, but then we inter uh, interact and engage these individuals. We have some people on this call right now that have helped us uh, getting this virtual church together. Uh, so that's number one. That's number one uh, way that we go forward. Number two is our counselors. We have a call center. Our counselors are 24-7, and uh, we need more counselors. We need more qualified Iranians. Pray for us, because through that, um, uh, we answer the phone calls and people who are contemplating suicide. I mean, there was this young lady um, who took her parents to, uh, uh, to uh, in Urumia, Iran, northern part of Iran. Her parents had, uh, had coronavirus. She took him to hospital, hospital turned him away. She went and stood on this bypass on this bridge, wanting to commit suicide and throw herself down. We have a video of that and people rescued her. Uh, so people like that are contacting us saying, you know, I've given up on life. I just want to commit suicide and kill myself and my family if you're going to die this horrible death. That is an opportunity for us to be able to speak blessing to people of Iran. So Nazanin and our team of, of program response, that's another way that the resources goes to these people to help us minister tangibly to people of Iran. And then again, we don't have all the answers. A lot of our ministry partners are intentional in Iran. They're doing amazing work. They have a great message for Iran. They don't have a platform to bring the message, but we give them the platform. So your resources, your help allows us to provide a free platform to these individuals as well. And uh, lastly, we stand, um, we stand accountable to all of our friends in ministry. Uh, so uh, that, that's, I think, God's heart. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, Jesus film. We aired Jesus film into Iran, my friends. People devoured that series of Rivka, Jesus film, uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, they're, they're all powerful, powerful tools uh, where people just readily watch and they come to Christ. Yeah, that's right. So another area of the fund are resources, just like you mentioned. And that means Bibles, Jesus films, other types of resources like that. I wanted to ask Nazanin real quickly, uh, how have you seen these resources play a role? And I know there's difficulties and security issues with getting resources into the country, but sometimes we can offer them digitally and other things. But how have you seen these resources uh, play out in the lives of the viewers uh, when, they, when they receive their Bible or when they get a copy of the Jesus film for the first time? Well, that's very exciting because Bible is big inside the country. They cannot find this anywhere. They go to the libraries, you know. Uh, we encourage them to come and download from our website or come to uh, these messaging apps, you know, Telegram and WhatsApp. We give it to them. And, uh, but getting the book itself, uh, we have one guy in a, in a village down south of Iran, and he keeps asking for boxes of Bibles. And he says, well, I can't help it. I, um, because we tell him, you have to be safe, you have to be careful, you cannot be reckless on the street passing out Bible. But he says, I can't help it. I give one person, and his friend comes and asks me for another one, and I don't have any. So um, periodically we send him, you know, boxes of Bible and he wow. passes them out within a week. So Bible is big. We have, you know, those STD cards that we passed out, you know, those really um, people enjoy those, especially the Jesus movie. People love Jesus movie. Even when they call us, they say, can you please just show Jesus movie? We love to see Jesus and, you know, his passion and his character, how he loves people. It's such an encouragement to a, to a you know, a dying world, a world, you know, a community, people who don't know God. You know, they've never heard of Jesus other than a prophet. Um, but when they encounter the true Jesus, the real Jesus, you know, it, their world changes and they want to cling to that. They don't want to let go, you know. Mm -hmm. So the more gospel, the more Bible, the more Jesus movie, the more live shows we have, 
the more people are hungry. And this hungry is so contagious. It's just That's spread. fantastic. Pastor Sasan, I want to jump to you. There is a question here. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, the viewer asks, he says, I'm already connected with many Iranians and friendships and looking for practical insights and ideas for communicating the hope and peace. What Can you speak to that as our last question? Well, I mean, I think our resources on mohabbat.tv would be a good place to start, referring people to these programs. And I wanted to say this. One of the reasons that... Uh, there is a spiritual revolution happening in Iran and in many other parts of the Muslim world is because for the first time in history, for the first time in history, Muslims with no access to churches, Christian communities or Bibles can sit in the safety of their homes and watch Christian satellite TV programs. So we shouldn't just talk about the coronavirus crisis. And I want our audience to know that for a decade and a half, Mohabbat TV has been broadcasting Christian programs. That's the lifeline uh, for, for all Iranian Christians. That's their lifeline to spiritual nurture and nourishment. That's their faith. That's their faith community. So we should, uh, you know, we are doing special things during this time of crisis, but we need to let, uh, we, we need to let the church around the world know that the, the, the key role that satellite TV is playing in the growth of the Christian movement in Iran and, and equipping and resourcing house church networks. We are playing a key role in that movement and we are asking the church around the world to partner with us in that vision. Amen. Mike, as we're, as we're wrapping this up, what are some ways that our viewers can stay in touch with us? How do they find out more? How do they keep hearing more about uh, what Heart for Iran is doing? Please, first and foremost, visit us at heartforiran.com. That's number four. And um, I also have a Twitter. I try to be uh, to put as much as I can in there. It's um, the, the handle is at Mike underscore Ansari. Uh, and uh, we'll be more than happy to put that information on Heart for Iran as well. The other way that you could get, uh, get more information is send us your email. We do send, uh, you know, we are going to be doing more webinars. So if you would like to be a part of that for future, do send us your email. We promise not to spam you. Uh, but um, that's another way. Uh, we do have, for those people that uh, are Iranians and are believers and would like to get involved, you may be across Iranians that are, um, you know, just uh, become new believers, send them to mykelisa.com, M-Y-K-E-L-I-S-A.com. That's a resource where, um, you know, we, we are helping and training people how to, how to learn the meaning of church, and also we have resources, and that's how they could join us every Thursday live for virtual church service. Um, we also have websites for refugee across Europe. There is, of course, the speakers called masihiat.com, M-A-S-I-H-I-A-T.com. If there are refugees that want to learn more about Christianity, Christianity 101 in offered there, and we assign e-coaches to them. Uh, and also for Iranians who you may know that want to learn more about, the, uh, about Jesus, visit us at mohabat.tv, M-O-H-A-B-A-T.tv. Uh, we are trying to be involved on all different platforms. Reach out to us, contact us, email us. We bless you and thank you so much for giving us, giving us one hour of your time today to be with us. Amen. Thank you so much, Mike. So heartforiran.com, heart number four, iran.com. That's the place to go. You can find the links for everything else. Um, the giving page, uh, the resources for Farsi speakers, that's all there. We want to close out with a word of prayer. Thank you so much for joining us. Pastor Sassan, would you close us with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you. We thank you that in the storms of life, we can be assured of your love. We can be assured that our good shepherd is with us, that even though we go through valleys of the shadows of death, uh, our Savior is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. So help us to look to you in these difficult times, to look to you for our security, uh, for our assurance, for our future hope. Uh, we thank you uh, for the Iranian church. We thank you for Mohabbat TV. We thank you for all the people that are supporting these ministries so that we can encourage the church in Iran and around the world. And we pray that, uh, Lord, that the whole world will be, get, will be rid of this virus uh, in the near future. Uh, but in the midst of this uh, storms that we would uh, find a deeper relationship with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thanks again, everyone, for joining Amen. us uh, on this webinar. Thank you. And if you have questions, you want to follow up with us, heartforiran.com. Info at heartforiran.com is the email to send it to. We look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to uh, working together to continue to reach the people of Iran. Have a great day.